And the key is verification. Every, every detail of the story should be traceable to a document or source, should be verified by a document or a source. And if you um, have this serious disease of being a docaholic, it helps. Most of us investigative journalists are docaholics. We love documents. Maybe we love them too much, but it's very, very useful to be a docaholic when it comes to line by line. We do the line by line uh, eight days before publication. We broadcast on Wednesdays, and we do this uh, process on Tuesday, the week before. And the reporter have to be prepared with all the documents in, in, uh, in order. That is very, very important, that every source should be traceable and easily find when we do this process. Uh, and reporters should also make sure that we have all the uh, allegations, respond to all allegations. And the editor, of course, has to, has to watch the story to uh, get the, the overall picture. What is the feeling? Is it fair? Is it uh, balanced? Is it something that uh, sticks out that we should uh, talk about? And then read the manuscript and mark all the facts, all those facts, conclusions, and criticisms that should be verified or discussed. Some editors use this model, yellow for facts and conclusions, and red for criticism. Um, this line-by-line -line operation takes about four hours to eight hours. And that's not much. I mean, if we spend so much time on doing research, uh, re interviewing, recording, editing, writing, and so on, why should we spend so much time at least to make sure that everything we're going to publish is correct? That's the least our audience, our viewers, our readers could expect of us, that we do everything we can to minimize the risk of errors. And we still make mistakes, but we have to try to minimize it, the risk of doing it. Um, and line by line requires concentration, which means that we get into a room, uh, we don't have to lock the door, but we have to put off the cell phones, and we need concentration. Clean, complete manuscript, and all the documents should be available online, in the computer, or on paper. And we also want the key interviews, uh, transcripts of the key interviews. And then we start. Are all facts correct? Every, everything, everything should be verified. Statements, names, figures, quotes from interview, interviews. A person we have been interviewed might lie, but if this person lies, we have to know about it. And maybe it can be justified to publish a lie, but we should know that this person is lying or if this person is saying something that is not correct, we should know about that. So we have to line by line what people are saying also in the program. Um, and the reporter has to verify even what seems to be harmless facts. We made a story recently uh, about a young drug addict. He was at a treatment center, and his mother knew that he was in a very, very bad shape. At this treatment center, the, the, the addicts were not allowed to use drugs, but they did it anyhow. The control was minimal. And this young guy, he died at this treatment center. And this uh, story was very, very sensitive, very, very compelling. And the mother of this guy, Leon, he told, she told um, our reporter that I called the treatment center six times, telling them they have 
to look after my son. I'm, he is such a bad shape. I called them six times. Then our reporter said, very, very interesting. Uh, but in our newsroom, we have something called line by line. And that means that I have to verify everything. So I, I cannot publish that you call the treatment center six times if I cannot verify it. So please, uh, can I ask you for getting a, a report, a te telephone log report from uh, your telecom company uh, verifying that you called six times? And our reporter got this uh, telephone log. And you know what we found? We found that she did not call six times, she called five times. Then you say, six or five times, does it matter? Oh, of course not. But if, if we have found she only called two times, one time, then it would have mattered. Frequent, frequently answered questions. We discuss, when we find in, in a manuscript, uh, some people say, or well, there are hundreds of examples. How many are hundreds? We all know that journalists always want to maximize everything. I asked the reporter, how many are hundreds? He said, 218. I said to him, well, for me, hundreds, when, when we say hundreds, uh, I think of maybe 600, 700, but not 200. Um, so we have to have precision in our journalism. We shouldn't write hundreds. We should write 200 or 218, if it is 200 or 218. Overstatements are very common. Everybody says, everybody says, or oh, this, this government, they haven't done anything to help the person. They haven't done anything. And if you write like that, that means that you have the burden of proving they haven't done anything, because maybe they've done something. He was talking to her 24 hours a day. Is that possible? I asked the reporter, and the reporter says, yeah, of course not. But that's what you say. Yes, but we had to stand for precision in journalism almost 24 hours a day. The riots spread through the whole country. Was it really that bad? No, of course not. Um, and to rely on other media, our dear colleagues, is very, very risky, we know that. Uh, in one of our manuscripts we found that uh, a jihadist coming back from Syria uh, came to uh, Cannes on the French Riviera with 900 kilos, 900 kilos of explosives. explosives. We did a fact check uh, on Google and found it was 900 gram. And in fact, when we read the same article afterwards, in the last sentence, we found the same fact, 900 grams in the same article. But of course, 900 shield is much better, much better if you want to maximize the negative. We always want to do that. This is the big challenge uh, to draw conclusions. An investigation without conclusions is a, an uh, investigation that will not make any impact. You have to tell your viewers and readers, what does this mean? As a news journalist, we are used to report what different sites are saying. Now suddenly we are supposed to make conclusions ourselves. We are not used to that. That's not according to our tradition to make conclusions ourselves. But that is a challenge we have to take. And when it comes to line by line, there's a lot of discussion. How far can we go in our conclusions? Maybe we have to soften it, or maybe we can make it more sharp. Uh, yesterday, two of my reporters told about the Telia Sonera uh, cross border uh, investigation, uh, corruption deal between uh, the Swedish telecom company, 
Phyllis Mira and uh, the dictator's daughter in Uzbekistan, Gulnara Karimova. We had a discussion when we made this program. Can we say that she was bribed? Can we make that conclusion? At that time, when we had this discussion, the police investigation was going on. And it had started because of our work. If we say that she is bribed, and if the prosecutor later on says, no crime, corruption deal cannot be proved, bribery cannot be proved, how is the standing of Swedish television then? Because if a reporter says in a story she was bribed, it's not the reporter who's saying it, it's the program, but it's also the, the company. The company is con stating that she is guilty of bribery, together with the bosses at the Swedish telecom company. Now, we cannot conclude she was bribed. We say that she is a suspected bribe. This old man here, he is the, the owner of IKEA. He is an icon in, in, in Sweden. We could prove, his name is Ingvar Kamprad, we could prove that he for many years has said to the Swedish public something which was not true. He has said that all the money, all the profits is going from the IKEA all over the world, is going to an, uh, a non-profit foundation in Holland. But we could reveal that the money went to a private foundation in Liechtenstein. Then we had a discussion. Can we say that Ingvar Kamprad is lying? We could show that he had said in TV interviews, in newspaper interviews, he told about this non-profit foundation. Not a word about the private foundation, his own foundation in Liechtenstein. Or should we say, Inva Kamprad is not telling it like it is? I think it could be, uh, have been justified to say Inva Kamprad is lying because he had to do, when you, you have to prove that the person is doing it consciously, consciously, if you say that someone is lying. The burden of proof is on you. And in this case, as uh, he has said this uh, many times, that the IKEA is controlled by this foundation in Holland. I think we could have said, stated that he is lying. But we did not. We said only that he's not telling it like it is. And I'm glad we did do that because this program, we had o uh, almost two million viewers in a population of nine million people. And 85% hated us after the program. Because, as I said before, Eva Kamprad is an icon who should not be investigated in Sweden. Sometimes we use this model to examine the conclusions, to get a way to analyze what do we have, can, do we have the grounds for saying this? What speaks for, what speaks against? Very important part of the line by line is to make sure we get response on all allegations. Sometimes we find uh, criticism on A, B, and D. And we find answers to criticism on A, B, and D. But what about C? What about C? Isn't that a critical point against this um, person? And then the reporter says, well, it's a little bit critical, but I don't think it's uh, that much criti criticism. But we know even the smallest piece of criticism that is un unanswered will used, be used against us. So everything that is critical should be answered to, or we should at least give an opportunity to the criticized person to answer to this criticism. And then the tricky 
uh, question, how to check absent facts. Facts that should be included, but, it's, but are not included for some reason. How do you identify those facts? There are some questions you could ask. First of all, is any relevant information missing? Then the reporter says, of course not. Of course not. Okay? The next question is a little bit more difficult. If we bring in facts into the story that we have decided not to include, if we bring this facts into the story, would that change the picture? If our public, our viewers or readers, if they knew that we had decided not to include these facts, would they be disappointed with us? Interesting question. Or if you been confronted by an investigative media reporter questioning your selection of facts, would you have any problems? That's an interesting question. This type of discussion can lead to that we include some facts that gives more fair, more accurate, more balanced picture. And the last question, is it anything that bothers the reporter? How do you feel in the stomach? Is it okay? Um, I talked to uh, one reporter. She made her first line-by-line -line process, and she said to me, I hate line-by-line, -line, but I love to have it done. Now I feel much better. I feel much more comfortable. Now I think I can sleep at night. I don't have to worry about missing some facts, making some mistakes, because now I know I have the, the whole newsroom behind me. In fact, the reporter, she had the editors in front of her, because at this stage, if we make something wrong, and uh, we have uh, five editors that I work with, if something goes wrong, then I, as the editor-in-chief, hold the editor as, as responsible, not the reporter in first hand. Of course, the reporter has responsibility, but for me, it's the editor who is the main responsible person when it comes to fact-checking and quality control. By the way, I, um, another very experienced reporter came to me one day after line by line, and he said, not one single mistake, not one single amendment. I said, that is impossible. No, not one single amendment. How can you explain this, I told him. I, I should have been happy about this, but I was questioning him. It could not be true. It has never happened before. We always make at least one, two, three amendments. Then he said, yeah, you know, me and my colleague, we made our own pre-line-by-line, -line, before the real line-by-line. -line. And that's something uh, that reporters tend to do more and more. They have a line-by-line -line mindset during the whole investigative process. And all those temptations that shows up during this process, it's much easier, easier to say no to temptations as they know they will be questioned in a very tough and hard way at this line-by-line -line process. We are working with TV, and um, working with TV means that images, pictures, are very important. I will show you a short clip. It was a story about the uh, union, trade union for construction workers. And this is a trademark for the construction workers. Um, and, yeah, you can see it yourself. Do you see any problems with this? 
Det är inte bara byggnads som använder sig av den här blanketten. Alla A-kasser i Sverige använder precis... You see the helmet? And what did you see? SS symbol, yeah. Okay. And this was included in our program, in our story, in our, and uh, the day after, uh, I was uh, uh, very early in the morning, uh, a media reporter, online media reporter, called me and asked me for comments on the nasty scandal in Uppdragansny. What? Nasty scandal? What do you mean? Where had you had SS logo in your program? What? We? And what happened was that uh, our graphical uh, graphics, the guy on the graphics, he went to Google Image, and he thought that that up on the left, that's the best picture of this uh, uh, helmet at the trade union trademark. And how could this happen? You know, as I said before, if it goes wrong, I hold the, the editor as responsible. And the responsible editor for this was me. I was the, the editor of this story. And the fact is, I saw this uh, story two times uh, in, on a small screen and one time on a big screen. We always have a, a quality a control uh, viewing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the day before a broadcast just to make sure nothing slips through. And I didn't see it. I didn't see this Nazi symbol. It's unbelievable. You get blinded. We all make mistakes. And at that time I realized that not only line by line, also frame by frame. Um, I'd like to conclude with uh, something we call uh, UG, Uppdrag Granskning, UG, UG reference, which means that we publish online uh, an interactive script where we publish as many sources, documents uh, that we can, so that people can go deeper into our story and read the documents which we, uh, we build our story on. This is from the uh, Gulnara Karimova and the Telecom scandal. And this is a way for us to, uh, to make it easier for, easier for others to, to uh, examine us, make it easier for other um, uh, newsrooms to do follow-ups. And I think it also will uh, get higher precision in our journalism because our reporters know that we will publish all, everything we can uh, when it comes to our sources because we do not publish anything that could lead to our uh, secret sources. So to conclude, um, line by line light, you might say you don't have the resources we have, but I, I say that you always have some minutes, maybe only 50 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, to do what you can to make sure that everything you publish is correct. If you're working with news, news stories are often quite short. It doesn't take that much to do uh, fact-checking. Facts, verify, conclusion, examine them, and allegations, check the response. And if you want to contact me, here's my mail address, and you can also get uh, our manuals, which we have published on, online. And at 12 o'clock, I will be back here and doing uh, the ABC of investigative journalism, the basics of investigative journalism. Thank you. News, thank you very much for this very inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, I, we have quite a few minutes uh, to pick up some questions from the floor. Uh, I will start up with, uh, well, first asking you whether uh, this presentation of yours with so nice uh, slides will be available. If it is available, how do people can get access to it? Uh, please contact me. 
And the reason I'm saying this, I have not have the rights to all the pictures sure. <laughs> in the presentation. So I, I have to take those pictures away. But there, so please send me an email and I will send you the presentation. Very good. And I wanted to ask you something which uh, strikes us journalists all over the world. When you mentioned that uh, you go as far as possible to get the target yeah. to respond to, to a story, which is, of course, necessary and desirable at all times. But more and more in many countries, uh, the targets would rather stay still and silent and won't say anything in expecting to find a, f a flaw in the story mm -hmm. to put a libel mm -hmm. case against yeah. the media outlet. Yeah. So have you been dealing with that situation have you been facing suits, uh, mm. and how you deal with that? Yeah. By working the way we are doing, uh, it's clear that we have done everything possible to get the other side of the story. That gives us a very strong position. We, uh, it quite often happens that we are threatened by libel, uh, but the people who are doing that, they soon realize when they contact their lawyers, they cannot do anything against us, because we have done everything we can to get that side of the story, and the story is, is correct. Uh, many of our programs are reported to the, we have a, uh, uh, a government um, regulator, uh, a regulating authority, uh, which regulates the TV uh, production, and people can, uh, the viewers can report our programs to this, to this regulator, and it's very, very seldom that we get any criticism from that regulator because we are doing it. And thanks to doing this three-step model, because they have got every chance to respond, and they didn't take this opportunity. And then they have to pay the price for that. And when it comes to libel in Sweden, because of the Swedish law, they have no chance at all. Maybe we can get... Uh, uh, you know, in, in USA or in, in uh, England, if we publish online, and that's a risk. But so far, no yeah. problems. So you're lucky in Sweden, because <laughs> you've got good laws. Yeah. So I open up for uh, the audience. If someone wants to make a question, please raise your hand, and the microphone will be handled to you. Okay, just over there. Just uh, give you the microphone. Please, if you can, stand up and spell your name, please. Eivind Birchilla with the Norwegian Broadcasting, NRK. You talked about you want to get an interview with the person or the entity that's been criticized in one, year, one of your documentaries. And then you have these steps. You first ask openly, and then you ask a second time if they don't say yes, and then you in advance say all criticism, every statement. But why don't you give them all the facts, all the criticism in the first request. In Norway, we have to, mm. as the Code of Ethics of Journalism says, you have to give them the opportunity to prepare for the interview. Mm. Why yeah. not? Um, now first, we don't know at an early stage what exactly we are going to publish. We don't know the exact phrases. Uh, we, d we don't know that until we have come very near the end. How are we going to put this uh, criticism into the story and how will we formulate the criticism? Uh, so that's why, if we knew it before, then we would give them it at an earlier stage. Um, I forgot to tell you that when it comes to... Th there is a fourth step, and that is, of course, the, the ambush interview which we do sometimes, and I forgot to tell you that we made an ambush interview on Ingvar Kamprad, the IKEA owner, and as he is a very old man, almost 90 years old, people hated us after doing this ambush interview, and in fact, we even received death threats because of this. So that's a solution uh, you have to you use very restrictfully. I think. Good. 
please say your name and where are you from? Yes, my name is Christian Slot. I'm from uh, Denmark Radio. Um, you say that um, you have this line-by-line -line confrontation with the reporter, and then you say go or no go. But we all know that Uptak Gansning is every week, every Wednesday. So you need to have uh, quite a lot of programs in the pipelines if you say no go. <laughs> so, my, so my question is, uh, how often do you say no go? Uh, how, how long time before the broadcast uh, is this line by line? And how many times uh, do you have to say, well, we can't show this program, so you must have some other programs in the, in the pipeline. I know that you are quite, you have a lot of resources. Your program is well known in Scandinavia for being some, something of the best investigative uh, t television journalism that is made. But um, did you ever get in a squeeze here where you really didn't have anything to, to put on the screen? Or how do you deal with this? Yeah, it has happened that we have really serious problems. And then uh, we go to Denmark and try to find a solution there or to Norway. Uh, if they can help us, we have colleagues in Denmark, colleagues in, in Norway. That has happened. But in fact, these uh, controlled, these checkpoints are helping us. Because before we had the, this start kickoff meeting, we had reporters sniffing on one idea weeks after week after week after week after week. Now we give the reporters maybe two or three weeks. And then we have this kickoff meeting. I will tell more about that uh, at the next session. Uh, and then we penetrate the idea, as I said, very critically. And if the idea survives this uh, kickoff meeting, then we know we have a minimum. We have the minimum of doing a story. And that means it's very, very seldom that we, uh, after I said yes at the kickoff meeting, that we don't do the story. So I think this start meeting is very, very important. And at the start meeting, it's, uh, we have you know, uh, the editor of the reporters. I will be there. And then we have the devil's advocate. Because a story for us is an investment of maybe $100,000. And so we have to spend a couple of hours, three hours, maybe even four hours to discuss this project. And after that, the risk of it not will end up in the story is very, very small. May I ask, you mentioned a dollar figure there. Uh, I'm sure there are many, uh, we have an international audience. This is a uh, state-owned TV. It's a public television in Sweden and you have a team of 35 people working with you. What is the budget, the annual budget for the program, uh, how it's been evolving through the years, and have you been facing any problems lately with budget, or are you satisfied what, which, um, what do you have? That's uh, classified information you're asking for, but I can tell you that we are doing uh, 45 programs a year, but. Uh, Seven of those uh, programs are repeats, summer repeats. That means we are doing 38 uh, programs with uh, investigative stories, and we have a budget of one million kroner, which means roughly $120,000, something like that, a program. Per so program? I, yes. Uh, so $120,000, it's one million Swedish crown, roughly. Per program or for the whole? Per program. Per program, and okay. We, uh, and we do 37 programs okay. with newly produced investigative journalists. Mm -hmm. So then you can make a conclusion yourself about our budget. I haven't said anything about that, but you can make your conclusion. <laughs> Very good. Any more questions from the floor? We are a little bit ahead of time. Uh, so, well, I must... Floor. Oh, yes. Final one here. Please say your name. It's from uh, TV2 Norway. I was just wondering about the, the there have been some stories. Um, you said that you uh, you made a confrontation confrontation early, and um, last year was a confrontation with the Norwegian Ski Federation that got a lot of um, news stories way ahead of the show, yeah. <laughs> uh, way ahead of the of the actual program. Um, are you using and these things uh, for making PR for your show that you, you you were open and talked about it and even yeah gave the media some some pictures I I guess of the confrontation. Do you mean this ambush yeah. into you technique? Well, we use it less and less. I, 
In fact, we used it uh, last week. Uh, and if you do that, you have to make sure that you have your viewers on your side. When we made this on uh, this uh, ski boss in Norway, I uh, doubt that any Swede felt sorry about this Norwegian ski boss. But when it comes to Ingvar Kamprad, it was an, another thing, of course. But you have to be very restrictive because you have to make sure that you, the viewers are as upset as the reporter is when doing this. Otherwise, it will go wrong. And it will affect your credibility. Maybe in Norway, our credibility was affected by this in a negative way. But I'm not sure. Uh, we have uh, a real final question here at the end. Well, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. This is uh, Azar Sayed from Pakistan. Uh, I work for Pakistan's uh, largest TV network, uh, Geo News. I have two uh, questions in two different situations. Uh, in third world countries, some politicians and uh, some key office holders, some, sometimes they leak the information to the reporters and the journalists, uh, particularly I'm talking in terms of the TV journalists. And they want that information to be aired immediately. And sometimes it happens that they invite you and they don't want to name themselves and they, they give a specific uh, information but not the complete picture. And as you have mentioned and rightly mentioned that the uh, uh, the selected information is also having a problem. You need to have the complete picture. So what one should do at that point when other two journalists are also sitting with you and they are going to give the news and you would start a fact-checking issue, A. And my second question is when you start getting the version of the target, Sometimes it happens that he or she is completely dumb. They don't speak at all. So what we do at that time? Thank you. Okay, if I, get, if I got the first question right, you mean that uh, your competitors, they will rush and do the story immediately. But if you work in, in our way, do the fact checking first, then we, you be, will become too late with the story. Uh, when, I, when, it, when it comes to um, investigative journalism, uh, competition is seldom a problem because we are often alone when doing it. But if you are mentioning a person, a company, a government, uh, in a negative, under negative light, you have to make sure what you publish is correct. I think that's more the important than to be first with the story. And the second question, if the, uh, the people in power, did you say they are dumb? Or they, at least they don't say anything. They don't want to comment on anything. And that's getting more and more common. Well, then it's, the story ends up with, we have to say, we did not get any comment on all these allegations from this subject of the investigation. All right, we passed already 11.30, and I would like to thank Nils for this uh, uh, great presentation. I ask a uh, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.